It wasn't designed to win beauty contests. It wasn't built to win races either. Its only mission was to move people reliably and economically. And it did this one task very well. This is a chronicle of one man's vision amid a world in turmoil, of rejection by many and acceptance by an unwanted few, of assassinations, world wars, the birth of the age of Aquarius, and the dawn of the 21st century. And this is a love story with a cast of millions, all who came to adopt a simple mechanical marvel as a member of the family. In light of its virtues, and in spite of its shortcomings. This is the saga of Das Wagen für Das Volk, the people's car. Most of us think of the Beetle as the first economy car of the 1950s, but the genesis of the Beetle can be traced back over a century to the birth of the automobile as we know it. The Beetle began as the germ of an idea in the heart of a young boy living in the Austrian village of Maffersdorf in northern Bohemia. It was the late 19th century, a time when life in Europe held a golden glow and benevolent monarchies ruled a continent in peace and prosperity. From an early age, Ferdinand Porsche was a nonconformist and free thinker. He was apprenticed to the family's metalsmith shop but had no talent for metalwork and actually detested it. Although his father, Anton Porsche, refused to accept his son's lack of interest in the family business, his mother recognized that Ferdinand had a keen mind. In part, to keep peace in the family, she persuaded her husband to send Ferdinand to the Imperial Technical School in Reichenberg. There, at the age of 16, Ferdinand discovered the wonders of electricity. He would make the first practical use of his new knowledge in 1893, when he installed a complete electrical system in the family home, including lights, a doorbell, and even an intercom. A turning point in Porsche's early career came when in 1898 he obtained a job as an engine designer with Jacob Lohner. Learning of young Porsche's flair with electricity, he decided to give Ferdinand the opportunity to design an electrically powered auto. What Porsche created was a model of simplicity for its time, and just the first of many unorthodox creations by this eccentric teenager. The world's first front-wheel drive car, the Lohner Electric Chaise. In 1900, he, he designed a uh, front-wheel drive electric vehicle, which had electric hubs and uh, it was shown at the 1900 uh, Paris Exposition and he, he gained many awards from that car and really started him on his way. The car was immediately accepted by Vienna's high society. Even the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand purchased one. This was a revolutionary vehicle. He had electric motors on the front wheels driving them. So it eliminated the need for a drive shaft, transmission gears. This car was, had some early attempts at streamlining. And if you think about what it would be like to see a car like this on the streets of Vienna in, in 1900, it's, it's pretty amazing. He even made a four-wheel drive version of this car. Porsche himself set a new electric speed run record in the Lohner electric chaise over the famous Semmering Highway in Austria covering the 10-kilometer course in less than 15 minutes and averaging 25 miles per hour. But a significant problem with electric cars was the weight of the batteries, which in the loaner totaled close to 1,000 pounds. Porsche saw a partial solution. To eliminate the need for the massive batteries, he created a hybrid gas electric car, dubbed the Mixed. The mixed used a small gas-powered engine to turn a generator, which would either drive the motors in the wheels or recharge a bank of smaller batteries. A technical triumph, the design proved so successful that it was incorporated into the design of firefighting equipment and used in both Vienna and London. When Lohner sold his patents to Emil Jelinek, benefactor to Daimler of Germany, Ferdinand, now in his 30s and achieving some measure of respect for his innovative designs, moved on to Ostro-Daimler. There he worked on AD's Maha Automobile, 
the Austrian sister car to Germany's Mercedes, which, like the Mercedes, was named after one of Jelinek's daughters. Porsche raced the powerful Maha whenever he could. In 1909, he won the Semmerling Hill Climb. In 1910, Mahas finished one, two, and three in the Prince Henry Trial, a prestigious speed and endurance race. Ferdinand himself again drove the winning car to victory. Ferdinand loved to drive his own cars. He would take every chance he could to get behind the wheel. In the early years, this meant he would actually get out on the tracks and he would race. And he won, he won many races. As Ferdinand's reputation grew, so did his duties at Ostro Daimler. With the clouds of armed conflict now rolling over Europe, Porsche was commissioned by Ostro Daimler to design air-cooled and water-cooled aircraft engines. The tremendous range of Porsche's talents came into play in developing the land train. Using the mixed hybrid power, this bizarre creation with up to 10 cargo wagons, each with electric motors in the hubs, could snake its way along the narrow European roads with ease. The bitter reign of warfare finally fell upon Europe when on June 28, 1914, Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated at Sarajevo by a Serbian nationalist, and armed conflict enveloped Porsche's homeland. Ostro Daimler now gave Porsche the daunting task of determining how to move the heaviest gun ever motorized, the 420 millimeter, 26 ton Big Bertha. His solution, a six tractor trailer unit that used the hybrid gas electric C train. This massive amalgam of machinery could run on roads or rails and navigate even the most winding mountain passes. In 1917, in recognition of his pioneering design work in military hardware, the Vienna Imperial Technical School awarded Porsche his first honorary doctorate. After five years of brutal warfare, an armistice was declared in the fall of 1918. Europe lay in ruins. The populations of the defeated nations, including Austria, were impoverished. Porsche, ever the entrepreneur, saw opportunity in disaster a crying need for inexpensive transportation throughout devastated Europe. Porsche theorized that what the people needed and could afford were cars that were small, economical, and easy to maintain. He became intrigued by the challenge of producing a small, efficient automobile. It was felt by the manufacturers that motorized conveyance, uh, or automobiles or horseless carriages, should be only for the wealthy. Dr. Porsche early on disagreed with this. He, he felt that there was a mass market for the automobiles, that the people of Germany or the people of Europe deserve to be able to drive an automobile rather than pedal a bicycle or walk or take uh, some other form of transportation. Working closely with his longtime friend, Dr. Hans Ledwinka of the Czechoslovakian automaker Tatra, he began to develop the concept of a rear-engined, air-cooled vehicle with coil springs or torsion bars, a central tube chassis, and swing axle. He was a remarkable man. His idea was to develop a car that anyone could have, anyone could afford, yet was comfortable. He did not want a miniature big car, which many people thought. Um, all the cars on the road were large, and he was looking for something that truly could accommodate the roads, the people, and be inexpensive. Without much money of his own, Porsche needed a sponsor. Austrian film magnate Count Sascha Kolarat listened to Porsche's ideas and decided to give him his first shot at developing a small car. The first prototype, named the Sascha after its benefactor, was a small four-cylinder high-performance racer that immediately went out and won the 1922 Targa Florio open road race in Sicily. Porsche himself, accompanied by his 12-year-old son, Ferry, drove one of the cars. The three Sashas that had raced in the grueling contest were then driven home to Vienna. In 1923, when Ostro Daimler withdrew funding from Porsche's small car venture, terminated all racing, and decided to stress large touring cars, Porsche quit in disgust. 
he then traveled to Stuttgart, Germany, where he became technical director and board member at Daimler Motoren, where he conceived the massive K and S series Mercedes. With these powerful six liter racers, Daimler Benz came to dominate the Grand Prix circuit of the late 20s. But although he was enjoying indulging his love of racing, Porsche still dreamed of building a small car for the working class of Europe. He had noted what Henry Ford did with the Model T in America and believed that he could go him one better. As early as the late 20s, Dr. Porsche began looking for a manufacturer to build his concept of a people's car. He needed the money uh, as a designer to build the prototypes. However, every time he would get a car to the prototype stage or get to the point where he felt it was feasible to begin a production, the manufacturers would pull away or back away from him. At Daimler-Benz, Ferdinand had limited success with a mid-sized six-cylinder, two-liter car. He then proposed a smaller engine car, a one-liter, but the board of directors would not go along with it, so he just walked out. He then went to work briefly for a company called Steyrwerk in Austria. But when they were bought out by Daimler-Benz, he decided to go out on his own and to form his own company. By 1930, Porsche was back in Stuttgart, and backed by Adolf Rosenberger, a racing driver, he set up his own firm. Here, he, his son Ferry, who was now 20, and a small staff, set about developing car designs on contract. The opportunity to once again try his hand at light car design came in the form of Porsche's very first contract. It was with the Wanderer Automobile Company, one of the four firms that would eventually become Auto Union, or Audi as it is known today. Porsche felt that the cars of the day were too tall and not sufficiently aerodynamic. He designed three slope-reared cars for Wanderer, a 1.7 liter, a 2 liter, and this larger 3.25 liter prototype that Porsche later used as his own transportation. On Porsche's next commissioned project, he shortened his design for the larger Wanderer to create his first small rear-engine car, the Zundap Type 12. Porsche believed in the air-cooled concept, but the Zundap was funded by Fritz Neumeier of the Zundap Motorcycle Company. Porsche was prevailed upon to use a five-cylinder water-cooled engine with disappointing results. This car was a dismal failure. It broke down, it overheated, it was so unreliable that Fritz Neumeier withdrew his support to the car. He wrote over his rights to this Volks Auto to Dr. Porsche, and so it seemed like a setback at the time, but it really was the beginning of the next step of the development of the Beetle. Porsche then turned to Germany's NSU Motorcycle Company, where Porsche's reputation for innovative design gave his plans for a people's car an open door. In 1934, Dr. Porsche, now 59 years old, would unveil the most significant step in the evolution of what would eventually become the Beetle, the NSU Type 32 Volks Auto Prototype. It had all of the ingredients that Porsche had envisioned. It was air-cooled, had a four-cylinder engine with an integrated transmission and differential mounted over the rear drive wheels, a wheels-at-the-corners chassis design, and it was inexpensive to build. Porsche believed that at long last, his vision of a small car for the masses would come to be. But although the car ran well with a top speed of over 70 miles per hour, when NSU entered into a deal with Fiat in which NSU could only build motorcycles, the Type 32 project was scrapped. Porsche's dream once again came crashing to earth. But Porsche was a survivor who kept many irons in the fire. A strange turn of events involving Porsche's friend, Baron Klaus von Ertzen of the Auto Union Car Company, brought Porsche in contact with the man who would finally make his people's car a reality. In 1933, Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany, and he was always looking for ways of expressing Nazi supremacy, whether it be through sport or politics or whatever. And he was aware that a new formula for Grand Prix racing was due to start in 1934. 
So he offered any German company that would build a racing car to this formula half a million Reichsmarks uh, per year as a subsidy. And this was immediately picked up by Mercedes-Benz, who was the, and remains the oldest uh, motoring company in the business. But Professor Porsche uh, had already drawn up some designs for his own racing car. And now that he was with Auto Union, he went to see Hitler in 1933, taking with him Hans Struck, who was a very successful mountain climb driver and was known briefly to Hitler. And Porsche persuaded Hitler that two German cars racing for the country would be a much better bet than one. And so Hitler agreed to this because he could see that the competition between the two would be very healthy. Uh, but instead of doubling the subsidy, uh, he cut it in half, so Mercedes and Auto Union only got a quarter of a million Reichsmarks each. Porsche was put in charge of Auto Union's racing program and was more than pleased to help the upstart company compete on the Grand Prix circuit against Porsche's former employer, Daimler-Benz. Porsche was ready with a high-performance version of his revolutionary rear-engined swing axle design that he had first developed for his lowly Volksauto. The Auto Union racing car was the design of Professor Ferdinand Porsche, uh, who was uh, even then uh, one of the top designers in the world and who had uh, designed several Mercedes-Benz cars. Porsche's design for the massive supercharged V16 racer for Auto Union put him back in the business of racing. By the standards of the day, the main innovation of the Auto Unions uh, was that they were mid-engined. They had the engine behind the driver. Uh, this is, of course, common practice everywhere today in, in motor racing. But then it was new, but not entirely new, because back in 1923, Mercedes-Benz had built a car called the Tropfenwagen, which had its engine behind the driver. Uh, it wasn't terribly successful, and Mercedes did not pursue it. But uh, Professor Porsche decided that was the way to go. The Auto Union's Silver Arrows came to dominate the racing circuit, winning the German Grand Prix, Swiss Grand Prix, Gloss Glockner Hill Climb, and America's Vanderbilt Cup race behind the inspired driving of Bernd Rosemeyer and Hans Stuck. In 1937, Bernd Rosemeyer would go on to be the first man to travel at over 250 miles per hour on a normal road in a streamlined version of the Silver Arrow. But although Porsche enjoyed racing, his long-held vision of a small, efficient car still eluded Herr Doctor. Meanwhile, Germany's Ministry of Transport was exploiting the promise of owning an automobile to give Germans a glimmer of hope from the depression that had gripped the entire Western world. Hitler believed that the freedom of motion that good roads and inexpensive autos would give every German citizen was critical to keeping the German people's support. During the 1930s, the government in Germany conceived the Autobahn system, or the system of throughways as we know it in the United States. One of the original design parameters for the Volkswagen was an automobile that would be able to drive at 100 kilometers per hour all day long, or 62 miles per hour, giving good gas mileage and carrying the full family. The government in Germany felt at that time that a nation would be judged in the future by the strength, length, breadth of their road system or the Autobahn system. And the development of the Autobahn in Germany was a very popular concept from the German government. The German government requested ideas for a small car design from Porsche in 1933. But it was not until June of 1934 that Porsche received orders to begin production of three prototypes. Seriously underfunded, and in spite of the animosity of Germany's established automakers who were forced by the government to help fund the project, Porsche managed to deliver the three prototypes in October of 1936. Although his competitors dubbed it the Ugly Duckling, the cars performed well in tests covering over 30,000 miles and finishing at Porsche's home in Stuttgart. In May of 1938, the cornerstone of a government-subsidized plant of immense proportions was laid at a site in the swampy countryside of Lower Saxony that would later become the city of Wolfsburg. Porsche had paid a bitter price to achieve his dream. 
he was in bed with a dictator who threatened the very welfare of the working people that he had hoped to serve with his radical design. Meanwhile, the German labor front needed money to fund its expansionary plans. It turned to the promise of a people's car that every German family could buy and perhaps someday own. And the way that they bought it was in advance. They would get a subscription book and each week they would pay a certain amount of money to the German government. In exchange, they would receive stamps to put in a coupon book, similar to the old SNH green stamp program. And after they had filled the requisite number of books, they would, be as, they would be able to go to the factory and pick up their Volkswagen. They were assigned a Beetle number when they began the subscription program. Massive amounts of money flowed into the German government from this subscription program for the German people to buy Beetles. When Hitler invaded Poland in September of 1939, the Wolfsburg plant that was to have built cars for the people was converted to producing vehicles of destruction. But shortly after the military operations began, the factory at Wolfsburg was converted to wartime production. Ferdinand Porsche was brought in to redesign the Beetle for wartime production. Two famous Beetles were produced during World War II, or among collectors anyway. One was called the Kubelwagen, which roughly translated means the bucket car, or was later known as the thing as it was produced in, in uh, Mexico in the mid-70s. And the other was the Schwimmwagen, which was an amphibious Beetle that had a propeller on the back of it and was able to cross rivers and, and uh, swim across ponds and be used as a truly amphibious staff car uh, during the war. The last year or so of the war, the Wolfsburg factory took a terrible beating. Uh, the bombing uh, was endless and because the factory was producing uh, equipment for World War II. Peace finally returned in 1945. Like much of Europe, the Volkswagen plant lay in ruins. Ferdinand Porsche, now 72 years old, was imprisoned in France for collaborating with the German Reich. But although Ferdinand's vision of a people's car had been delayed, it was not yet dead. Porsche had always believed in tapping into the resources of his workers. He would spend long hours on the manufacturing floor, listening to their ideas and concerns. Now, the workers' loyalty to Porsche and the lowly Beetle would pay off. But when the war ended, the factory just lay in absolute ruins. Uh, one third of the roof was gone. When it rained, uh, the water came in one door and went out the other door. They had no electricity. It was just pile after pile of rubble. And the people in Wolfsburg or the people in Germany were pretty well demoralized. But the factory lay in ruins at the end of the war. The uh, factory was devastated during World War II because of its contribution to the war effort. And one British major, Ivan Hurst, was assigned to try and put it back online, which he did admirably. But uh, it was his job to bring the factory back online. And Germany was in turmoil after the war. It was terrible. People were starving. People needed something to do. So his job was to uh, crank back up the factory to get it rolling again. And they uh, grabbed an old beetle, I believe, gave it a fast job, presented it to the uh, powers to be. And they said, this is great. We need transportation for Germany. Go ahead, get the factory online if you can do it. He gathered the workers that were still in the area and put together a crew, and they actually uh, got the factory back online. Started building the Beetle in 19, 1945. They built a few Beetles, probably about 58, plus some other vehicles, miscellaneous vehicles. Major Hurst knew nothing about operating an automobile factory, but he decided that if the workers were willing to give it a try, so was he. The first Volkswagens to roll out of the plant were post office delivery vans. Although the British had grandiose plans for the liberated Volkswagen factory, only 9,000 cars had been produced by 1946. Hearst's superior officer, British Colonel Charles Radcliffe, began to cast about for help in running the VW plant. Relief came in the form of one Dr. Heinz Nordhoff. Nordhoff had managed the German car maker Opel before the war. Although Dr. Nordhoff felt that the Beetle was a poor thing, cheap, ugly, and inefficient, 
he did not see any better opportunities presenting themselves, and so he accepted the British invitation. Volkswagen never would have survived into the late 40s uh, and 1950s had not someone of Dr. Nordoff's uh, character, uh, work ethic, and intelligence arrived. Uh, he was very similar to Ferdinand Porsche in many respects in that he was not an aristocratic German manager. The norm in Germany at the time was that the manager did not talk or interact with the workers at all. Uh, he would go to his subordinates, tell them what was to be done, and the word would be passed down. Dr. Porsche had always worked with his hands, with his workers, in the design. He was a real grassroots, hands-on type of designer and builder. Heinz Nordoff, having been trained by General Motors and having run the Opel truck factory during World War II, with his American training, was also a hands-on worker who did not believe that he should isolate himself from his workers or from the people on the factory floor. Dr. Nordhoff set about modernizing the plant, upgrading living conditions for the workers, and revamping the basic Volkswagen Type 38 design. Brakes were improved, the hard ride softened, the noise level was reduced, and the engine was pepped up. Meanwhile, Ferdinand Porsche, who was no longer directly involved with the Beetle, had left prison in 1947 and set to work with his son Ferry on his final project. A weekend racer, as Porsche called it, one that combined the knowledge and wisdom gained through decades of work on the people's car and a lifetime of play on the roads and tracks of the world. The aptly named Porsche. But that is another story for another time. By 1948, 20,000 Beatles had rolled off the production line in Wolfsburg, while in the USA, people were getting their first look at the Beetle, as Dr. Nordhoff showed Dave Garraway his pet project on the new medium of television. What are you going to put in all that space? Well, we are going to manufacture our car in this country. Are we in competition with you now on, uh, for example, the Volkswagen? As we see it, the American market leaves so much room for a small, well-proven economic car. As production grew, the first Beatles began their journeys to other countries. In 1949, the British turned ownership of the plant over to the federal German government. It was time for the lowly Beetle to roll into the United States. Ben Pon, a Dutch car salesman, thought he would give it a try. Ben Pon, 1949, was a Dutch entrepreneur and automobile salesman decided that the U.S. market provided a great avenue uh, for Volkswagen and, and for Ben Pond. He brought two Beetles uh, over to the United States, unloaded them on the docks, I believe, in New York City, and tried all one summer to sell the two Beetles to the U.S. He was very unsuccessful. He supposedly sold one car to a dealer in the United States, and the other he traded for passage back to Holland. Came back to Germany and told Dr. Nordoff and the people in Wolfsburg that yes, he thought the car was marketable in the U.S., but they would have to make some changes in it, and that there was a market in the United States, as I recall, for about 150 cars a year. The next year, Dr. Nordoff appointed Hoffman, who was an importer in New York City, as the sole U.S. agent for Volkswagen in the United States. As the story goes, Hoffman was also the Jaguar importer. The Jaguar in 1950 uh, was very much in demand. Hoffman created an idea to sell the Volkswagens that if a Jaguar dealer wanted a Jaguar, he would have to take one, two, or three Volkswagens. And that was the way that he got the original Volkswagen off the ground on the eastern seaboard. What happened, though, was that he began selling the Jaguars, the Volkswagen followed, and pretty soon the dealers were calling back and saying, we want more Volkswagens, we don't need a Jaguar. But Dr. Nordhoff had created a solid infrastructure for the Beetle with distribution, service, and marketing policies carefully planned for each local market. He needed American dollars with which to buy equipment for expanded production of the Beetle, and counted on Ferdinand Porsche's ugly duckling to blossom into a swan in America. 
In 1950, when an aging Dr. Porsche toured the bustling factory with his host, Dr. Nordhoff, a sad smile crossed his lips as he witnessed the fulfillment of his lifelong dream. When Dr. Porsche passed away in 1951 at the age of 75, he had lived to see his vision of a car for all people become a reality. This one man's indomitable spirit had carried him and his unorthodox creation through cataclysms unequaled in history. Although not interested in world affairs beyond the workshop and racetrack, this single-minded visionary, equal parts artist and engineer, had made an immense impact upon the lives of millions, and his proudest accomplishment was finally beginning to do the same. By the early 1950s, the Beetle was getting noticed in the USA. People began to realize that although they were small by Detroit standards, they had a host of attributes that endeared them to the car buying public. The average guy could go down and buy a brand new car, and it was only like $1,600, give or take a few bucks, you know. He could go down and buy a brand new car. He would, he would run for years without any trouble. He didn't have to fool around with it. It was fun to drive. It was good in the, like I say, good in the snow. Uh, it, it just was a great car. The price structure stayed the same for many years, but the quality was fabulous. I mean, the Volkswagen used to brag about how many quality inspectors they had as compared to everyone else. So their, their quality was number one at Volkswagen. Where every day a bloodthirsty mob of 8,397 inspectors decrees whether or not a Volkswagen will live or die. Should it lose favor with any one of them, even for the slightest whim, it will die. Should any one of its 5,000 parts be deemed defective, even for reasons unseen by the untrained eye, it will die. For only after every single part has passed at least three inspections, and only after 16,000 triumphant inspections in all, may a contestant then leave this arena with a worthy title, Volkswagen. Now, let the games begin. But the element that made buying a Beetle less of an act of faith and more of a wise decision was the network of fastidiously maintained showrooms and service centers that developed wherever the Beetle was sold. Dr. Nordhoff saw to it that every dealer maintained standards of service that exceeded even the domestic auto manufacturers. By the mid-50s, the Beetle uh, had began to build a footprint in the United States. One of the successes of Volkswagen in the United States, though, was, again, Dr. Nordoff. He felt that the success of the Beetle in this country, or the success of Volkswagen in general, would only be as successful as its dealer network in their service or parts. One of the areas that always fascinated me about the way they came to the U.S. market in the 50s when Volkswagen really began to sell was that the dealers were required to carry an extensive parts inventory. Essentially, a dealer had to be able to build, if he was going to be a Volkswagen dealer, and this is about 1957, a Volkswagen from parts from his parts in his dealership at the time. He either had to have the parts on the shelf or on order. And if he could not do that, his franchise was in jeopardy. And I recall one of the very early dealerships in Vermont uh, was missing two minor parts. As I recall, one was a, uh, a main shaft uh, for a transmission and the other was a wheel bearing. And if those parts could not be obtained, he was going to lose his franchise. Dr. Nordoff believed that if the parts were not here and the car broke down and the car was going to be disabled for any period of time, people would lose interest and lose confidence in the car. By now, the love affair with the Beetle was in full bloom. In 1955, the staff of Volkswagen celebrated the production of the half-millionth Beetle. As the Beetle began to take off in America and throughout the world, the Wolfsburg factory increased production to 3,000 cars per day. Even so, demand was far outstripping supply. In 1960, I had a, I had a, a big car, and I wanted to buy a brand new Volkswagen Beetle. 
So I went down to my friendly Volkswagen dealer, and I and I had uh, I said, "Listen, I want to buy uh, a Volkswagen," and he said, "Sure. What color do you want?" I said, "Blue." Okay, and he just didn't care, and I finally said, "Well, when can I get it?" He says, "Now, maybe four, five months." I said, you got to be kidding me. I need a car today, you know. I can't wait four or five months. So uh, I went out and had to buy another uh, Detroit steel car because, uh, you know, they just were so popular. They couldn't import them fast enough. Up until now, if you had a 51 Ford and you wanted a 53 Ford, you would go into the dealership and say, here's my 51 Ford. What will you give me for the 53? Well, when the Volkswagen hit the U.S. market, they were in such short supply that people were putting deposits on the automobiles and waiting a year, uh, sometimes 18 months for a car. One of my best friends growing up, uh, put a his mother put a deposit on a car and she was in early 1957, she wanted a 1957 sunroof. When she finally got the car, it was a mid-58 sunroof and it had a big window in the back instead of the oval window. But she had waited almost 18 months for that car. When a car came into a dealership, if you had ordered a Strato Silver or a Silver Blue car and it came in black, if you didn't want the black car, you would fall back on some of the dealer lists until a car came in uh, that met your expectations. Uh, many of my parents' friends growing up as a boy uh, had Volkswagens, but they did not have the color they ordered, and they didn't have the options they ordered because it was a take-it-or-leave-it situation. The dealers could not get the cars, and the dealers were able to get full price for the car. Until the late 50s, Volkswagen had relied upon word of mouth. But in 1959, VW decided to launch an advertising blitz that will always be remembered for its simplicity, straightforwardness, and honesty. Americans were used to high gloss, flashy ads touting power, prestige, and cars that said last year's models almost before they left the showrooms. Go! Split second getaway in the most exciting car in the world today. And in DeSoto for 57, you got Torque Flight automatic transmission, the smoothest, most responsive transmission ever made. See and drive the 1957 DeSoto. With triple speed push button driving, it's the most exciting car in the world today. But after poking around the factory in Wolfsburg for a few weeks, the staff of Volkswagen's new agency, Doyle Dane Burnback, came back to America with a new respect for the lowly Beetle and a fresh approach to selling cars in the new world. And now the star of the 1949 Auto Show, the car of the future, the car the public wants, the all-new Bissoto. The long skirts will be the next look on the fashion scene. The Studebaker will be the next look on the automotive scene. So the man to see if you're buying your next car for keeps is your nearby Packard dealer. Long, long, the 49 Hudson is the car. So Volkswagen will constantly be changing, improving, and refining this car. Not necessarily to keep in style with the times, but to make a better car. Which means to all of you... Of all the promises made at the 1949 Auto Show, we at Volkswagen kept ours. One of the neatest moves that Volkswagen made was to hire the advertising agency of DD&B to create an advertising campaign for the Volkswagen. And their early ads were totally different. Uh, whereas American ads were hand-drawn pictures of automobiles that often made the people look smaller and the cars look bigger, Volkswagen would put a picture of a Volkswagen face on with one word under it, ugly. Uh, their ads just caught your fancy. They caught your attention.
Have you ever wondered how the man who drives a snowplow drives to the snowplow? This one drives a Volkswagen. So you can stop wondering. Since everyone's conducting a mileage test, we at Volkswagen thought we'd conduct one. So, we modified our body and our engine and used someone who didn't weigh much to drive. And we got 84 miles per gallon. Ridiculous. Nobody normally drives like this? That's precisely our point. Nobody normally drives like most of those tests. The Beetle, under their advertising, became almost like a family member. It became a pet. The Beetle was so different that people actually adopted it. Some people almost as a family member. I've had some people call me up and for some reason say someone has to go to an old folks home. And they've had this Beetle since it was new. And they're not, they're not concerned with selling it. They're concerned with someone actually adopting it. And they, they have to interview the people to make sure this has actually happened. That they want to make sure they get a new owner that'll take care of their, their prized beetle, their beloved beetle, their family member. You know, it's been said that a beetle was, was a member of the family who just happened to live in the garage. I don't know how many people actually have names for their cars and they treat them like human beings. I mean, they treat them like people. So they bring these cars up to me. They don't say, will you take care of my car? You know, they'll say, will you take care of Ralph or Peter or whatever, you know? And, and, I, and believe it or not, uh, I will, if I see a dent or a bang in a car, and I, I'll more than likely come up and say, what have, they, what have they done to you, you know? And then, then we go ahead and fix it. In college, I drove a Beetle, as did most everyone else I know. And uh, unlike any other car, we tended to give them names. And I, for the life of me, don't know why, but mine was called Junebug. My wife and I had a number of used VW Beetles, and we loved them. And then it was 1971, my wife said, let's get a brand new one, and she chose a yellow cabriolet. And since it was yellow color, lemon yellow, we called it Jack. And it was so much fun. We would take it on camping trips. Uh, we traveled around with it, and whatever we did with it, it seemed to add an extra dimension of fun. We once made a movie around it, and the car had just, it was so much fun, but it was so, it had so much integrity as a vehicle. Beetles were now arriving in the U.S. in ever-increasing numbers. Owning a Beetle became some kind of reverse status symbol. If you owned a Beetle, you were a little more clever than the guy next door. Mr. Jones and Mr. Crampler were neighbors. They each had $3,000. With his money, Mr. Jones bought himself a $3,000 car. With his money, Mr. Crampler bought himself a new refrigerator, a new range, a new washer, a new dryer, a record player, two new television sets, and a brand new Volkswagen. Now Mr. Jones is faced with that age-old problem, keeping up with the Kremplers. I'm actually snavely being of sound mind and body to hereby bequeath the following. To my wife Rose, who spent money like there was no tomorrow, I leave $100 and a calendar. To my sons, Rodney and Victor, who spent every dime I ever gave them on fancy cars and fast women, I leave $50 in dimes. To my business partner, Jules, whose only motto was spent, 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 I leave nothing, nothing, nothing. And to my other friends and relatives who also never learned the value of a dollar, I leave a dollar. Finally, to my nephew, Harold, who oft times said, a penny saved is a penny earned, and who also oft times said, Gee, Uncle Max, it sure pays to own a Volkswagen. 
I leave my entire fortune of $100 billion. When you're driving one of these little cars on, an, on a summer's day, or if you've got a convertible with the top down, uh, it's just a fun car to drive. You put it through its gears, it whines, it complains, uh, it moans and groans, and it makes lots of noise, but it's a great fun. It's just, just a fun car uh, to drive along the road. Having a car was fun as a teenager because a car allowed, allowed you to do a lot of things, but the act of driving didn't become fun until my first Volkswagen. There was this, this whole panache about the car that really probably only a Ferrari or something like that, maybe a Cadillac at the time, would have had. And while other automakers were changing the sheet metal on their cars annually, Volkswagen touted its hidden attributes. Some time ago, the Volkswagen people went to see one of Italy's most famous automobile designers. Buongiorno. Volete seguirmi, per favore? Buongiorno. Molto piacere. Ben arrivati, prego, prego. Buongiorno. L'ho fatto buon viaggio? Oh, ottimo. Oh, oh, Molto traffico in questi giorni. Eh? Oh, se fosse formidabile. Bene, bene. They gave him this assignment. What changes would you recommend in the design of the Volkswagen? He studied it and studied it. Then he said, Ingrandire il finestrino di dietro. Make the rear window larger. Solamente questo. That's all? Solo questo. That's all. We did, starting with the 58. A Volkswagen is never changed to make it look different, only to make it work better. Dr. Nordhoff summed up his feelings about the Beetle when he said in 1958, it appeals more to me to offer the buyer a true value, a product of highest quality with a low purchase price and an incomparable resale value. By 1959, 470 dealerships stretched across the United States of America. 150,000 Beetles roamed America's highways. Over 621,000 Volkswagens had been registered since Ben Pond sold the first one in 1949. By mid-1965, there were over 900 dealerships serving over 2 million Beetle owners. The Beetle craze became a worldwide cultural phenomenon as it became the car of choice of the young and hip. Beetle stuffing hit college campuses. While beetle art and customizing gave each beetle owner a sense of individuality that seemed so essential in those halcyon days of peace and love. When it was discovered that the Beetle would float, a racing organization, Water Bugs of America, sprang up to supervise the Beetle's nautical activities. Two Englishmen even tried to cross the English Channel from France, but had to abandon the Beetle due to high seas. And of course, the Beetle spawned the kit car craze, even knocking off its prestigious cousin, the Porsche. But to everything there is a season, and by the late 1970s, the Beatles' popularity was on the wane. When the last Beatles were offloaded onto the docks in Baltimore and Houston in 1977, 28 years had rolled by. But the Beetle continues to sell worldwide. It is still produced in Mexico and Brazil and can be found in over 150 countries, almost anywhere a car will go and its simple but enduring shape has been applied to Volkswagen's newest derivative of the Beetle, the cutting edge Concept One. Volkswagen developed the Concept One and has now slated it for production because it was really interested in capturing two very important elements of the company. One is the nostalgia of the Beetle, of that warm fuzzy feeling that when you mention the word Beetle, people just smile and combine that with the other part that we're very proud of, and that's the engineering, and have a car that has the latest technology, the most advanced technology, and combine those two into a vehicle, hence Concept One. 
and it gives, it captures the lines of it. It's, it's back to the original with Ferdinand Porsche form follows function. It captures that, yet it also, under the hood, has all of the, the engineering expertise that the company is known for. People our age today, when you meet them and you start talking about your beetle and they start talking about their beetle, they sort of light up inside and they start to talk about their ski trips or the time that the car started when it was 25 degrees below zero or this child came home from the hospital for the first time at the Beetle. It was an important part of a lot of people's lives and just a great vehicle. The lifelong dream of Ferdinand Porsche has brought joy to countless millions over the years and is still enjoyed today. Its legendary economy, toughness and reliability are just a part of the reason why there have been more Beetles manufactured than any other car in history.